Good morning, Red Hawks Nation. I'm Ontario bear attack survivor Peter Zilstra-Moore, and you are listening to RHS News. You may be wondering about the chainsaw. Some people say to carry a whistle when you're in the woods. I say carry a chainsaw. Some people say to never store food in your tent. I say never eat food. That way, you won't smell like food and there won't be any meat on your bones. Be bear safe. Nation and welcome to your three six R three sixty morning announcements. I'm your host, Mrs. Bartell. It is Friday, June fourth, and day four on the school calendar. We start with sports news this morning, as the Jets and Canadians will face off tonight as the second round of the Stanley Cup playoffs continues. As you saw on the news yesterday, Mr. Hopper's table hockey game with his buddies accurately predicted the outcome and exact score of game one. Let's turn it over to Mr. Hopper for his take on game two. All right, Red Hawks Nation, there you have it. Canadians are going to win 3-2 to two against the Jets in game two in single overtime. These guys have to put away all the go-karts now. So there you have it, folks. 3-2 to two for Montreal in overtime. Let's hope Mr. Hopper's prediction is wrong this time around. Puck drop is set for 6.30 Central tonight. And sticking with sports, we did have an epic intramural softball announcement planned for the grade 7 to 8 students. But with yesterday's news of the extension of online learning, unfortunately, it won't happen. Considering we blew the remainder of the broadcasting budget on the promotional video, we'll show it to you anyway. A seasoned veteran in the final chapter of his career. An up-and-coming VP looking to make a name for himself. A grade 7 and 8 intramural best of 7 series. Who will claim the ultimate intramural glory? Team Cornelson versus Team Waldner. Sign up in the student lounge now. Stay tuned for the hopeful matchup of Team Scharfenberg versus Team Cornelson in the spring of 2022. Your Red Hawk of the Week is Eliza Friesen from Grade 11. Eliza's teachers say that she optimally engages in Google Meet class discussions and lectures. Her sense of humor adds so much to the class discussions and she works diligently on her assignments and submits quality work. Way to go, Eliza! Are you looking to win a team in the Red Hawks hockey card box break? Make sure to keep your eye on your email for today's school weekly newsletter. The R360 mascot, Michelangelo Marshmallow III, will be hidden somewhere in this week's newsletter. The first two students to email redox360 at rrvsd.ca, letting us know where he is, will win the Detroit Red Wings and the Edmonton Oilers in the box break. It's time once again for the Ice Bucket Challenge. Let's see which brave souls from Red Hawks Nation answer the bell today. Hey, I'm Mrs. Deacon and I was nominated by Heather Plus to the Ice Bucket Challenge. I was nominated by Levi Deacon. Hey, I'm D60, this is Bryn Laverne. 
Um, today I want to nominate uh, Jennifer Lowen, Gloria Duick, and Lola Eitz. And now I'm going to nominate Jenna, Toro, and Rebecca. And I nominate Mr. Hopper and Donovan to do the ice bucket challenge. Okay. Oh, this is heavy. <laughs> go, go, go. Remember, staff and students, you do not have to be nominated in order to participate, so send your videos in. And in our newest segment, we have a couple of new clips to share with you from the electric playground coming from around Red Hawks Nation. Let's take a look. The player featured in that NHL video has been offered an in-person hearing by the Department of Player Safety for those hits. Remember, Red Hot Gamers, you can share your favorite video game moments and have them show in on the R360 News. You can film them using a phone, Chromebook, or the video capture feature on your console. Email your clips to redhawks360 at rrbsd.ca. And before we sign off the air today, the R360 News team has a very ha has very happy birthday wishes going out to Hudson Reimer and Adelaide Tenbrink for today, as well as to Orin Eitz and Eddie Martins for tomorrow. Happy birthday, Hudson, Adelaide, Orin, and Eddie. Those are all of your announcements for today. Tune into the R360 News on Monday morning at 10 o'clock for a Jets update and a brand new concert contest alert. This is Mrs. Bartel signing off. Have a great day learning from home and a great weekend. Oh, what's this? It appears we have an added treat for you this morning. By request, it's another episode of the Cabinet of Curiosities. Please enjoy. Welcome to Aaron Menke's Cabinet of Curiosities, a production of iHeartRadio and Grim and Mild. Our world is full of the unexplainable. And if history is an open book, all of these amazing tales are right there on display, just waiting for us to explore. Welcome to the Cabinet of Curiosities. Elections have a tendency to bring out the worst in people. From smear campaigns and all-out lies to voters yelling at each other from opposite sides, politics is, as they say, a circus. It's no wonder that many voters instead choose to stay home, refusing to participate in a process they feel is unfair or even corrupt. 
which is exactly what happened in Sao Paulo, Brazil in 1958. Now, at the time, the city was suffering. The sewers were in need of serious repairs. The prices of common goods had risen to astronomical heights, and a food shortage had thrown everything into chaos. And understandably, people were upset. They'd had enough. And with an election around the corner, they saw their opportunity to turn things around. There was just one problem. The candidates who had been running were all equally unappealing. No one wanted to vote for them, and many of the 3.5 million citizens of the city sat out the election. But those who voted found an alternative. Her name was Kakareko. She was a last-minute candidate who had no idea her name was even on the ballot. After she was added, slogans in support of her were plastered all over town, and Brazilian voters became energized again. Finally, they had a candidate they could believe in. Her campaign wasn't given much thought by the other candidates. Surely someone so new and inexperienced couldn't beat Brazil's political heavyweights in such an important race. And then, on October 8th, the votes were cast. One of the men running for city council earned a whopping 10,000 votes, an impressive showing from his supporters. Kakareko, on the other hand, brought in a few more. 90,000 more, to be precise. You see, 100,000 citizens had cast their vote for Kakareko, a landslide that ended the campaigns of 11 opposition parties almost instantly. It was a surprising victory for a candidate who had been added as a protest vote against the 540 other parties running. Naturally, those other candidates were furious. They blamed their losses on a secret plan to undermine their campaigns. Could it have been a foreign interest or a corrupt puppet master pulling the strings behind the scene? The answer, though, was far simpler. Local journalist Itabori Martins had grown sick of all the politicians talking out of both sides of their mouths. None of them seemed worthy of occupying a seat on the city council. So rather than sit out the election entirely, Martins suggested Kakareko on a whim. And then a half-hearted nomination somehow took off. Unfortunately, Martin's scheme fell short. There was no way election officials would allow Kakareko to serve on the city council. For one thing, she was only four years old. For another, she was a rhinoceros. She had been on loan to the San Paolo Zoo for three months and inspired a new sentiment among the people. Better a rhinoceros than an ass, they said, and it started gaining steam with voters who looked at their options and wanted nothing to do with any of them. Kakareko may not have ever gotten to serve on the city council, but her unwitting foray into politics did have one lasting effect. She spawned a political movement in Canada. Yes, thousands of miles to the north, a new political party was forming. It was called the Rhinoceros Party of Canada and was established in 1963 as the spiritual successor to Brazil's Kakareko. Their motto, a promise to keep none of our promises, said it all. They were only there to disrupt the status quo, much like their rhino pal down south. When they formed, they named Cornelius I as their leader. Cornelius lived at the Granby Zoo in Quebec and was, you guessed it, another rhinoceros. He held that position for almost 30 years, right up until the party was dissolved in 1993. Over the course of nine elections, the rhinoceros party didn't win a single seat in the House of Commons, but they stuck to their fairly simple platform, one that resonated with thousands of Canadians. Candidate Brian Gold, who ran for election back in 1990, described that platform as well as anyone might. Just two feet high, he said, and made of wood. I hope you've enjoyed today's guided tour of the Cabinet of Curiosities. Subscribe for free on Apple Podcasts or learn more about the show by visiting curiositiespodcast.com.